maybe we'll just give you a few numbers. So 4.54 billion years, that's how old the Earth is. Does anyone know the significance of this number, 200,000 years? Not quite, that probably came before. Uh, 200,000 years, shout it out if you know. Yeah, that's right, I heard that somewhere. This is how long the modern human has been around, right? And does anyone know the significance of this number, 100,000 years? Anyone? It's, it's a little relevant to what we are going to be. Yeah, speech. So we've been using voice as a means of communication for 100,000 years, right? Uh, which is weird because we've been using voice as a means of communication for so long, yet it has taken our personal computing and how we interact with personal computing this long to actually, you know, be voice enabled, right? So if you really chart uh, how we have interacted with personal tech and personal computing from, you know, sometime in the mid 70s, we started off with very basic character mode. Think of it as extremely primitive versions of terminal that a lot of developers use nowadays. You had like this tiny monitor which was black and white with like few, uh, you know, squiggly lines. You typed out things. Uh, it wasn't it was the best user interface, but it was what was there back then. Uh, sometime ten years after that, in the mid 80s, of course, you moved to the graphical user interface uh, era, where a lot of companies started operating systems that were graphical in nature. Right, so you could see files, you could see a word document, you could see like an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, of course, they were very primitive back then and just interacting, I mean, I don't know how many people here used computers in like the early 90s, like when I first used Windows 95, I found it so difficult to actually move a mouse and drag like a, you know, like a file or even while playing solitaire, it was really difficult to drag like a card because I just wasn't used to that sort of way to interact with a computer. Of course, things progressed and in the mid 90s was the era of the web. Uh, I was one of those people who used Netscape Navigator and Internet Explorer back in the day. We had really, really basic HTML websites with blinking text and marquee text that moved across the screen. And of course, now it, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a lot more advanced, right? And we, but we still use the web. In the mid 2000s, of course, came the mobile revolution, something that we're all familiar with here in India, right? Uh, we might have, it might have skipped the web and the GUI and the desktop era, kind of skipped India as such, if you look at it from a popular point of view. Uh, but we really felt the mobile era here. We, we, we moved from very basic, you know, like handheld, uh, you know, tiny Nokia phones with like very clunky keypads uh, to the advanced sort of smartphones that we have today. And even that, if you remember surfing the web, uh, like maybe a few years ago, you had to, I mean, websites weren't really responsive, so you had to like zoom in like multiple times to uh, click on a link. And, uh, you know, but then we, I think, my screen is gone off. Yeah, you had to zoom in like multiple times to actually click on a link and they weren't really, they weren't optimized for mobile. But then it was people like y'all, like designers and coders and people who really worked on, uh, you know, mobile web who kind of figured out, okay, we have to make these things responsive, right? They have to look native to a mobile phone. So that's how, you know, we have come to this stage. Uh, if you can see almost every 10 years, there's sort of been a shift in how we have interacted with tech. So sometime in the mid 2010s, is around now, uh, it again shifted to the era of the voice user interface, right? Uh, so we've been using voice as a means of communication for a while, but it's taken personal computing this long uh, to actually come here. Uh, there are a variety of reasons why this has happened. Uh, one, and I can't stress this enough, but I think voice is the most natural way, the easiest way to communicate. Uh, but earlier it wasn't very easy to kind of do this, right? You had systems that could process maybe tens of words to then hundreds of words. But just to make something as simple as like say a dinner, a dinner reservation, you, you need like extremely good computing power. You also need a lot of data, you know, to really process what the user is trying to say. And right now we are at the stage where we have that data, we have that computing power. So it's a sort of perfect sum really, right? So voice really represents the next major disruption in computing. Uh, you know, we are in Bangalore, which is a, sort of the Silicon Valley of India. Uh, there are a lot of startups here in Bangalore, you know, most of the, for those of you who might not know, there are a lot of unicorns, unicorn companies actually started here, uh, right here in Bangalore. And we, we hear this word a lot, disruption, right? Uh, but I think in this case, it, it's true that voice is the next major phase in disruption because uh, it's one of those things we see where voice is everywhere and since it's such a natural way to communicate, it's something that we'll be doing uh, a lot more in the next few years. Now, uh, I must start off by saying I'm, I'm pretty honored to share the stage with Mr. Alan Cooper and he, uh, if you saw his talk earlier today, he spoke about working backwards, right? And I think it was a fantastic talk. 
uh, coincidentally, uh, Amazon has this philosophy of working backwards, right? Where we essentially, we kind of apply the same principles that Alan spoke about. And uh, it was with that idea, you know, so how many here use a Kindle? I use a Kindle a lot. I think it's a great device. That's awesome. And essentially, we had this idea of having like this device that could allow you to access any book in the world within a minute. Right? You could instantly download any book anywhere in the world if you had an internet connection in less than a minute. That was the idea, and we sort of worked backwards towards that idea. Like Alan said, we, you know, we, we didn't think of like constraints, basically thought if everything was magically possible, what, what would be like our ideal sort of device. And obviously that meant, you know, looking into publishing, looking into hardware, but it was with that principle we actually came up with the Kindle. Similarly, we saw this disruption happen, this disruption, this, this shift towards moving to voice. And our, our idea was to have a device that would be like the Star Trek computer, like the computer in Star Trek, right? Basically, it's everywhere. You can get things done by just talking to it. I think for the millennials in the crowd, maybe Jarvis from Iron Man or Avenger is, is probably a better example. But that's what we really wanted to do, right? And it was with that idea we came up with Amazon Alexa and Amazon Echo. That's a cross-section of sorts of the device. So let me quickly talk to you about the hardware itself. Uh, not, not doing too much of a product pitch, but uh, the, 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 the cool part about the device, I mean, it has a great speaker, blah, blah, blah. But also, I think the very cool part is it has a microphone array of seven microphones right at the top, right? And this enables this thing called far field recognition. So there was a lot of tech earlier that, you know, tried something like this, but uh, the thing that was very difficult to pull off was far field recognition where you can actually recognize or listen to someone talk from across a crowded room. Even if people are talking in the room, even if there's music playing in the room, right? And uh, this is possible with seven really powerful microphones that you see at the top of the device. Cool. Uh, now, when you, when you sort of buy a mobile phone, right, it comes capable, it, it comes, it has few capabilities, right? You can, I don't know, send SMS, you can take photos, uh, you, can, you have a calculator, an alarm clock, uh, you can even make phone calls, something I don't think too many of us do nowadays. But it comes with a few of these built-in things. Uh, but the first thing you do when you buy a new phone is to obviously download apps. You get WhatsApp, you get Ola, Uber, ClearTrip, whatever. Similarly, uh, with the Alexa device, there are a lot of things it can do on its own. Uh, you can ask it the time, the weather, you, you can have like social conversations with it, lists, reminders, get the news, play music. Uh, but you can also extend its capabilities or really enhance its capabilities by using these things called skills. Basically, they're analogous to apps on phones. And right now, uh, Alexa launched in India, I think, a couple of weeks ago, officially. And there are tons of skills available. I think the number in India is specifically 12,000. So yeah, do, do go check it out. <coughs> so now, I've spoken to you a little bit about Alexa. I've used the word echo. Uh, let me just make the distinction very clear. Uh, when, it, when I say Echo or Amazon Echo, I mean the hardware device in itself. Uh, Alexa is essentially the cloud service that really powers all these devices. So I'll probably use them interchangeably, but essentially what Alexa is, is it's a really powerful cloud service that does some things like, you know, speech recognition and natural language understanding. And there's a huge machine learning component built into it, right? And I'll talk to you about some of those things. Uh, it's essentially supported by two really powerful frameworks, right? The first one is called the Alexa Skills Kit which is essentially say you have some content, right? Or you have a service, maybe it's an app or a website, and you want to bring that content uh, into like an Amazon Echo, right? Or you want to bring that to a user through voice enabled, uh, you have to use the Alexa skills kit. There's also another framework called the Alexa voice service, which is essentially if you have a hardware device, anything with a speaker or a microphone, uh, you can bring the capabilities of Alexa to that hardware device. So maybe you've built like a smart toy, or maybe you've built something cool on your Raspberry Pi, and you want it to be voice enabled, uh, you can use the Alexa voice service to really you know, uh, make it voice enabled. Yeah, yeah, uh, all of this is absolutely free to you know, build on. So I'll, I'll be talking to you a little bit about how you can actually build skills, right? A little bit about the tech, and also how voice design plays like the most crucial role in actually building skills for Alexa. So. Let's talk a little bit about actually building for voice with Alexa. So this is the sort of typical interaction diagram for a user right here uh, to talk to an Alexa device. Now, most of the magic as such happens in the Alexa cloud. The hardware itself does just two things, right? The couple of things that it does is the first one is wake word detection and the second is beamforming. 
So what wake word detection is, is essentially your device is not continually listening to everything you say and recording, right? Because that would really shoot your internet bills up, you really don't want that happening. Uh, so it listens for this thing called the wake word, which in this case is Alexa, right? And only once a user says something like Alexa, will it start listening to what the user says and then it knows, okay, now is when I know when I need to process what the user is saying. Once it's listened to the wake word and it hears the wake word, uh, it essentially does this pretty cool thing called beam forming, where it detects the source of the sound, right? And this is pretty much what enables far field recognition. Uh, since there's a circular array of microphones, it's able to do noise cancellation on the other sides, uh, apart from where the sound is coming from, so that it can pick up the sound from across the room. So this is all, this is pretty much all the uh, hardware device does. Uh, it, it listens to what the user says after the wake word, and then it just sends that to the cloud. And in the cloud, is where all the cool things happen. If I have to really divide what happens in the Alexa cloud, it's a couple of things. The first one's called automate, automated speech recognition, which essentially is speech to text, uh, but it's slightly more complex than that, right? So for instance, if I were to say a phrase like 40 times, you can see that's 40 times, those are the phoneme, the units of sound, uh, for the phrase 40 times, right? A user could have meant something like 40 times, doing something the number 40 times, the user could have meant something like for t times, you know, a reference to chai, drinking chai, maybe uh, he or she is a uh, chai drinker. I could have meant, I could have said something like for t times, as in the user wants to play golf, right, and it's a reference to playing golf. Or maybe it's four people who want to play golf, right? It's very difficult to sort of uh, kind of realize what the user is trying to say. Uh, what Alexa does is accurately figure out this uh, by using a bunch of uh, different things. One is, of course, as a designer, you have to sort of provide like training data for this to happen, right? So maybe uh, maybe your skill just needs a number of times something has to be done. So you sort of provide that as training data. And then thanks to the sort of machine learning that's kind of inbuilt, Alexa knows, okay, the training data says that the skill needs a number of times, so it's probably 40 times, right? Maybe your skill has something to do with ordering tea and coffee, right? Uh, and you're providing that training data, so then Alexa knows, okay, it's probably for T times. You know, the user wants some chai, yeah? Yeah, so, yeah, so his question was, why, why, why do, why, why does he have to provide the information as a designer or a developer? So like I said, your, your skill that you're developing, uh, could be something to do with the number of times, like how many times you want like a song played, right? Or it could mean some, or your skill could be like a coffee tea ordering skill. Uh, that's difficult for, that's something you're developing, right? So you have to sort of provide the training data of the things that a user might say uh, to interact with your skill. And then that's how the speech to text happens rather accurately. So once that's done, once Alexa sort of figured out the speech and converted that to text, uh, it's really up to, again, the cloud to sort of convert that text into an intent, right? So now I'm going a little technical here, but natural language understanding, which is basically understanding what a human is saying and converting that into structured data is, is like the sort of key, you know, to, uh, to having like conversational UI, right? Uh, if I have to draw an analogy to the web, it's very different. If you have an app or a website and you have a button that says OK, you're sort of relying on the user to kind of figure out if, OK, uh, the word there is OK. So if I click that, it probably means I can go to the next step. And you're relying on the user's sort of innate natural language understanding to say, OK, if that person click, if the person clicks that button, they're going to the next step. Uh, but with something like voice, it's it's a little different, right? A user might say, okay, but the, a user can say something like, that's good, or go to the next step, or sounds great, or love it, or okie dokie, right? So how would you really match all these sort of utterances and handle all of that to go to the next step, yeah? So to do this, you have this thing called an intent, which is essentially uh, like the word says, right? It is, think of it as like a sort of feature your skill might have. Uh, let me give you another example. Uh, say your skill does weather. Right, and pretty much the one intent in your weather skill is to get the weather. Now there are different ways a user can actually say or ask for the weather, right? A user can say, hey, tell me the weather, get me the weather, what's the weather, uh, how's the weather? But they can also say something like, hey, do I need my umbrella today? 
or do I need my coat today? All of these utterances sort of match to the same intent. Yeah? So that's what the cloud does. It sort of matches all these different utterances uh, that a user might possibly say, and some of which, some of, uh, which you provide as a designer, uh, to an intent. <coughs> Once you get that intent, of course, it's structured data. Like I said, natural language understanding converts this human conversation into structured data a computer can really understand. So in your request, you get like structured data which goes to your backend. Right? In your backend, once you get some structured data, uh, you can leave it up to your developers to really do what they want. Right? They can you know, maybe call a database, uh, they can call a public API, they can have some hard-coded data. It's really up to you to you know, uh, code your skill. Once that's done, you send your response back. So let's take the example of the weather skill. Someone says, hey, what's the weather in Bangalore? Uh, it converts that speech to text. It converts that to an intent saying, okay, my intent is like a get weather intent. I send that structure data saying intent, get weather intent, city, Bangalore to my backend, which gets the weather. And the backend sends the weather back saying, hey, it's a pleasant 28 degrees in Bangalore right now. That is again sent to the Alexa cloud, uh, which does text to speech. Uh, what really, again, what really differentiates conversation that we're having, that we as humans have, versus a computer just reading out words, is things like, you know, emphasis or adding, uh, adding like a whisper or maybe spelling out words or maybe saying like a local Indianism, for example. Uh, all of that is taken care of by the cloud, by this thing called SSML, which is speech synthesis markup language. It's pretty cool tech. It's, 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 uh, it's a tech that's there in a uh, lot of voice technology. It's not something only related to Alexa. But essentially with that, you can, you know, add whispers, you can add, like if you want Alexa to say balle balle or matcha, you can actually get Alexa to do something like that. So, uh, yeah, uh, Alexa takes care of the text-to-speech as well. Once that's done, your device will tell you the weather or whatever the skill actually does. So that's the sort of general interaction flow of how a skill works. Uh, <coughs> yeah, sorry. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so there is also, uh, the gentleman here asked the question, what is this card component here? Okay, yeah. So, uh, even though Alexa is a voice first device, it comes with a visual component as well. There is a companion mobile app. A uh, lot of experiences are really good voice first, but sometimes you want to augment it with like a visual element. Uh, like say shopping for example. So if I say, hey, uh, what's the price of uh, a Raymond suit? Right? I'll get the price via voice, but I'd still want to see the suit before buying. So you can send like a visual response onto the card, like onto the app perhaps. Right? Uh, for instance, if you ask Alexa, what's the weather? It will tell you the weather in Bangalore is like 28 degrees, but it will send the weather for the next seven days in the card so that you have that data on your phone you know, whenever you want. Yeah, it comes on like a mobile app or even on your website if you log in to it. So essentially, it's a, think of it as a visual component that really augments the experience. It's still a voice first sort of experience, uh, but yeah, you really want to augment the experience with something visual. Yeah, it is. Yeah. 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 Uh -huh. So, so we I'll talk a little bit about that in like your design principles. But the way we see a lot of these things is how you would communicate with a human, essentially, right? I mean, if if I were to send you an email, it's there. But if I were to tell you something now, it's it's there in this particular ether, and then it's up to you to whether you want to remember it or not. So it's something similar. You can always come back to the skill or come back to me and ask me the same question, and you'd probably get the same answer. But that's how we see it as well. Okay. So uh, I'm here to kind of talk to you about key design principles for actually designing Alexa skills. Uh, this kind of applies to designing for voice in general, right? It's not specifically with Alexa. Uh, and, and the reason is, I think we've all been used to designing visually, right? Uh, now, most, lot of people, I'm, I'm guessing there are a lot of designers in the room, you guys would have designed like websites or apps. And uh, even for the ones who probably haven't, if I were to ask you to rate like an app's UX, right? I'm sure you guys will be able to accurately tell me what, what the good things are, what the bad things are, because, simply because we've used apps so much, right? Or we've used websites so much. Uh, it's little different when you're designing for something that's completely voice first. For one, there is there are no guardrails as such that UI provides you. 
uh, it's something that's completely natural. But the biggest difference is a lot of things that might read well, like you know, like okay, if you're showing like an error message or a success message, they might read well, but they don't necessarily hear very well, right? When you hear them, hear it out aloud, there's something very off about it, and that's not how users would typically converse, right? So because of the, these things, and because you know people find it a little difficult to sort of design voice experiences, uh, we have come up with like five principles uh, to really help you design for voice. Right? Uh, a lot of these principles might seem like sort of common sense, but uh, again, it, it's something that you really have to keep in mind while designing for voice. In fact, I mean, I come from, I mean, I started off my career as an app developer, right? And uh, a lot of times when we had to develop an app, we always started with like, hey, let's see if this API is working. We'd write like some boilerplate code. Uh, basically, we start off with the code, like maybe make a call to a database and then sort of say, okay, now let's figure out the interactions. Let's figure out what the user wants. It's probably not the right way to do so, but that's how a lot of uh, tech projects kind of start off. Uh, when it comes to voice, though, we really recommend not starting with the tech at all. Uh, the first thing you literally do is sort of simulate conversations between the user and Alexa, like literally write them down and have people read it to each other, purely because then you know how it sounds by ear and not like when you're reading it out. Yeah, so uh, just going and talking a little bit about the principles. Uh, the first one states that a skill should have a clear purpose. Again, this might sound very self-explanatory, but uh, I think it's really important to think of interactions that are made either faster, easier, or more fun, or better with something that's voice first. You really don't want something that, hey, I have a website. If I just get it, get like this Alexa to read out my entire website, it'll be cool, which is not really a great use case. Right? You, you really want to think of interactions that can be made either more engaging or fun or, or faster uh, by a voice. Like good examples are things like, you know, book me a cab. Like I can just say, Alexa, book me a cab. Uh, she says, there's a cab three minutes away. Do you want me to book one? I say, yes, done, boom, over. Uh, another great example is just generally interacting with smart home devices. When I enter my house, I'm just going to say, Alexa, switch on the light, and it switch on the, uh, switch, switches on the light. Yeah, uh, I don't. I really don't want to like pull my phone out, enter a passcode, open the app, have some authentication there, and then hit like an on button in the app to switch a light on. Or even better, do it like old school, where you're stumbling around in the darkness to look for a switch and then actually turn it on. Right. So that particular interaction is completely made. It made easier. It's made faster via voice first. And those are the sort of skills that you should actually build. Uh, I also typically tell people to, you know, sort of choose use cases that solve like very uh, modular sort of problems, as opposed to saying, as opposed to like saying something like, "Hey, uh, my skill is going to do literally everything. I'll help you book a cab, book a flight, book a hotel," uh, because then you're really setting the wrong sort of expectation. Again, remember there are no guardrails as such in voice, so users can say like random things to your skill, right? Uh, yours, yours might be like say. Uh, I know, a skill to book movie tickets, but someone might say something as random as pineapple pizza, right? Because you're not set that expectation, you're not set that purpose very well. So try and set that maybe, you know, via like a good welcome message or even the name of your skill or whatever, but uh, choose that specific purpose and, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, the second principle is skills should evolve over time. I think this is an interesting one. Now, if you think back to the first time you probably met a friend or a coworker, uh, think of the sort of interaction that you had with them. It, it would probably be a lot different from how you interact with them now. Uh, there's a good chance, you know, you introduced yourself, you said, hey, what's your name, where are you from, like, what do you do, that sort of thing. And uh, that is sort of how we also see Alexa, like really evolving over time uh, with the user. Now, evolving over time could mean a bunch of things, right? It could mean uh, one in terms of remembering preferences, uh, for instance, it can remember your name, right? Simplest thing, uh, I say, hey, my name is so on to the skill. So that's typically how that whole process goes. With, with this though, with like a voice-based skill, it's the opposite, right? You really want sort of variety, you really want uh, your skills UI to keep changing. In the sense that every time I log on to a skill, I want a different welcome message. I don't want the same robotic, hi, welcome to the skill, right? I want to, hey, like glad to have you back, or something, sometimes I want something maybe a little longer, like telling me about a new feature in the skill. So really try and evolve your skill over time in terms of its UI, uh, which again, if, if 
you draw an analogy back to the web is not something that we are told a lot to do, right? Because that uh, relies on sort of repetitive motions where a user sort of knows, okay, this button's here, this menu is here, so you know these are the patterns I need to do for this particular thing. Whereas you know, in voice, it's slightly different. Okay. Uh, third one, users can speak naturally to your skill. Again, this sounds very sort of self-explanatory, but it's important to remember we are in a voice-first. Uh, interface right here. So your user's cognitive load should completely be uh, on actually using the skill and not on trying to remember things within the skill. Right? So uh, a good exercise that I typically tell people who are trying to build skills is to try and think of the previous conversation you had. Like just think of a conversation you had earlier today, right? And think of the purpose of the conversation. Was the conversation social? You know, where you're saying, hey, how are you doing? How are your kids doing? How was your vacation? Or was it something that was completely goal oriented, where you're saying, hey, uh, can you give me directions? Hey, what's the time? Can you pass me this book? Something that's very goal oriented. Uh, also think of the role that you played in that conversation, right? Were you the ones asking the question or were you the ones, uh, were you the one answering these questions? So really think of these things while developing your skill and try and figure out how your users are going to converse. What role will your user play at that point of time in your skill? Right? Will they be the ones asking the questions or will they be the ones answering the questions? Is the purpose of your skill really social or is it goal oriented? Right? And when you start thinking of these things, will you actually start thinking about designing for voice first? Because we tend to go back to bad habits and you know, rely upon how we've been designing so far and still design for the eye as opposed to designing for the ear. Yeah? So like I said, your, your user's cognitive load shouldn't be on having to remember like an exact syntax to operate your skill. They should be also able to operate your skill with their attention distracted as, as you would when you're talking, right? When I'm talking to a person and someone distracts me, asks me for a question, I'm still able to answer that person fairly accurately, right? Alan spoke earlier about, you know, thinking fast and slow. As long as it's a question that involves something that's thinking fast, I think we'll all be able to answer. So think of these things again while designing your skill. Okay, Alexa should understand most requests. Now, with voice design, it, again, I come back to the point that there are really no guardrails like there are in UI. Uh, so sometimes things can get a little complicated. So let me give you an example. Uh, let's take the example of a simple travel skill, right, no? like something like a clear trip or a go Bebo. And essentially, the question Alexa asks the user is, uh, where do you want to go this, where do you want to go? Right? And the user says, I want to go to Goa this weekend. So if you see what's happened there, the user has over answered, right? Uh, typically in, in something like a website or an app, you'd have a drop down, where do you want to go? You choose from a list of options and that's it. But it doesn't work that way in conversation, right? If I ask someone, hey, uh, where do you want to go? I'd say something like, I want to go to Goa this weekend. So I'm not only answering where I want to go, but I'm saying this weekend as well. So it really wouldn't make sense from a design point of view for your next question to be, when do you want to go? because the user has already answered this, right? Uh, but unfortunately, how most skills are designed are very flowchart based, like very IVR, interactive voice response, where you're saying press one to uh, speak to this one, press two to continue, press nine, yeah? So basically what they, what a lot of skill builders, they fall under this trap of saying, hey, where do you want to go? The next question will regardless be when do you want to go, uh, you know, then what type of flight do you want to take, that sort of thing. Right? A, a user can maybe answer all of it in just one shot and say something like, I want to go to Goa this weekend on a first class flight and come back next weekend. Right? But then it would be completely pointless to ask the next six questions. Similarly, a user can do the opposite. Like suppose, a, um, suppose Alexa asks a user, okay, where do you want to go? A user can say something like, I want to go hiking from Bangalore. Right? The user is completely under answered in that case. Uh, they haven't answered where they want to go but they want to go from Bangalore and they want to go hiking. So you've got two other data points, but you don't really have the data point that you've been asked for. So this provides, a, it's a big challenge in itself, really, because if you design a skill to be like completely like a flow chart, like an IVR, uh, you're going to have really bad experience for your user and your user is going to get frustrated because then, and it then becomes very non-natural, very non-conversational. Um, there are ways you can actually do this from a design point of view. Uh, I won't go too much into detail, but basically there's this thing called graph UI versus frame UI, right? Where in a frame UI, you can get into the conversation at any point of time. So I can start off with, I want to travel next weekend, 
and then say something like I want to go to Goa, for instance, right? And uh, there is this concept called slot filling, which is essentially you define slots, right? Uh, slots are essentially variables, right? That complete an intent. So assume your skill has three slots, which is where you want to go, when you want to go, and how you want to go. And say the user says something like I want to go to Goa this weekend, it automatically fills those two slots and realizes, okay, the one thing that's missing is where they want to go from, let me ask that question, right? As opposed to it being like this completely linear thing, it's it's little more horizontal and it just fills in the slots and then you realize, okay, this one slot is missing to really complete the information that I need. That's what I'm going to ask the user and then finish this interaction. So that's what I really mean by Alexa should understand most requests. And the last one is skills should respond in an appropriate way. Now, again, this might sound like slightly self-explanatory, but I think it's really important why we're actually doing all of this, right? If you really look at it, uh, humans weren't sort of designed to interact or think in like a radio button or a drop-down menu uh, or these sort of constructs, right? So in a sense, with like apps and websites, we were kind of forcing ourselves, we were forcing humans to think like computers. With something that's conversational, uh, we're forcing computers to sort of think like human, right? So you really need your skill to sort of respond appropriately. Now this can mean a couple of things. Uh, it can mean things like, okay, obviously you don't have, uh, you know, like adult content on it or profanity on it because Alexa is meant for the family, blah, blah, blah. Um, but you also need to realize that you need to shield your users from any error handling. Remember, there are no real errors in conversation. Now, if I, were, if I go to dinner with a friend and my friend tells me something really weird and unexpected, I'm not going to say, error 404, right? I'm going to say, hey, uh, I really didn't get what you mean, or did you mean this, or uh, I'm sorry, can you repeat that? So you really want to shield your users and keep them away from this sort of error handling, right? Uh, it, there will be times when users say something that your skill doesn't understand. Maybe it's something random that they've said. Maybe it's something that you've not accounted for when you're actually developing your skill. But try and handle those instances gracefully. Like few ways you can actually do this uh, are by saying, hey, I'm sorry, I'm learning. Is this what you meant? Uh, or, you know, hey, these are the things I can help you with. What, do, what would you like me to do? That sort of thing. Uh, there are also ways using tech by which you can actually see uh, things that have not been handled by a skill and then account for them. Right? So maybe it's something legitimate that you didn't take into account while developing a skill. After all, there's no humanly possible way that you can say, hey, I know all the 8 billion ways a user can book a ticket, right? Because again, it's completely natural. It can be like a cultural difference. It can be a language difference. So you will find instances where users have said the right things, as in they've said, okay, where they want to go, when they want to go. They've said it in a different way that you didn't anticipate. So it's important to kind of an analyze all those things and, uh, you know, add it to the design of your skill as well. Cool. So those are the sort of five principles that we spoke about. Uh, so I'll give you an example of a skill that uh, does this pretty well. There's a skill called Travel Buddy, and you'll see all these principles being applied in the skill. So basically, a user says something like Alexa, launch Travel Buddy, and here's what the skill is saying. So the skill says, Hi, I'm Travel Buddy. I can easily tell you about your daily commute. Let's get you set up. Where are you starting from? So if you see, it's it set expectations well. Um, it's chosen. A, it's, it has a very specific purpose, which is to help you with your daily commute, right? It's not saying, hey, I'll I'll do like a bunch of things related to like travel and finance and stuff. It, it has a very specific purpose. Uh, it's also very goal oriented, right? There's not much socializing happening with the skill. Where it's saying, how's your day? And I'm doing good. It's straight to the point, right? And uh, it also is going to evolve over time by asking questions like, where are you starting from? So the user says Whitefield, which is a place in Bangalore for those of you who are not from Bangalore. And the skill says, okay, where are you going? I say electronic city, another tech hub in Bangalore. So then the skill actually gives me very contextualized information and says, okay, great. Now, whenever you, you ask, I can tell you about the commute from Whitefield to electronic city, right? So it's, it's revolving right there. It's going to remember my start and my source and destination. Uh, it also says something like the current drive time is 1 hour and 42 minutes. There is an accident on Hosu Road. By the way, this is a completely unrealistic time. If you were to travel in Bangalore between these places, you would probably uh, be on the road for far longer. So it's giving me information that's extremely contextual to where I want to go at that point of time. 
Say I come back to the skill like four days later and I say Alexa launch travel buddy. It's not going to ask me these same questions again because it realizes it's a commute skill. You won't change your commute too often, right? You're, you're going to mostly go from the same place, your home to work. So it directly just gives me the contextualized information which was your commute is one hour and two minutes as per that day. So it's using all those sort of principles that we have sort of discussed um, into like a skill. Now, if you really take a step back, um, while building your skill, we sort of follow this thing called crawl, walk, run. Uh, but if you look at it, I think the whole voice ecosystem in itself is, is going to follow like a crawl, walk, run philosophy, right? Where essentially right now we are really, really in the starting days. It's something that's going to be very ubiquitous soon. Uh, but I think all of us are still trying to figure out a lot of things about, you know, designing for voice because it's so new to all of us. So even with your skill, you should sort of follow like a crawl, walk, run uh, philosophy and first sort of determine what's your real core functionality. So if you take the example of that travel skill, uh, you know, it's a simple thing, just give an estimate of how long it would take to get to your workplace. It's very simple, uh, no jazz, no you know, bells and whistles. Then kind of get like user feedback and sort of optimize your skill. Maybe you can start getting, you know, like okay, there's a construction on this road, there's an accident on this road. Uh, things like that, little more information using like a API maybe. So you're really sort of improving like the sort of core functionality of your skill and you also analyze user feedback so you've gotten like you know more utterances that your user might say uh, and you've handled more of those things well as well. And at the end of course you know you have like this really really evolved version of your skill where you can proactively also maybe alert users of delays, right. To be honest no skill right now is at that phase uh, nor is the ecosystem if you ask me. But that's where we are really headed. Cool. So that brings an end of sorts to my talk. Uh, what we really say to get started is to really just start building things, right? Even if you don't know a lot of the tech, there are a lot of tutorials and templates that kind of help you build skills. Uh, and it's really easy to do. Uh, so just please go ahead and build skills. Uh, there are some resources that I'm putting up. The first one, alexa.design slash guide is, is a sort of summary of a lot of things that I spoke about today and I think it's pretty useful. Uh, there's a very cool free course on Code Academy. So just go to alexa.design slash Code Academy. And uh, alexa.design slash India has like India specific things. So you'll find some templates local to India. You'll find our next events, our meetup groups, things like that. Uh, I just really want to end by saying, you know, you guys are designers, you guys are creative people. So do go out and maybe build skills, see how you can, you know, creatively uh, do voice design and really connect with your users. Uh, it is something that's completely new, so it's up to people like yourselves to really shape how uh, voice design is going to be. So yeah, that brings an end to our talk. I'd really love to hear what skills that you're going to build. Uh, hit me up on Twitter, on my email ID, uh, right there. And also we have this contest running where you can tweet using this hashtag, design for Alexa, uh, about uh, skills that you want to see, maybe your ideas that you have for skills, and we'll give out an echo to one winner at the end of today. Yeah, so thank you so much. and. You have any questions? Yeah. Yes. I think yeah. Two. We have like a couple of minutes, so I'll take your question. Yeah. Tony Stark doesn't ask Jarvis to right. launch another app. Jarvis ties it all together. So do you yeah. do you see it going that direction eventually, um, or do you know if that's that's where it's headed? Yeah. Uh, that's a really good question, and uh, it is kind of where that's headed. Right? Even now, uh, if you try Alexa and it says, if you say something like, hey Alexa, book me a cab, Alexa inherently cannot book you a cab, but there's like Ola and Uber in India that can. So she'd say something like, hey, uh, I can open Ola or Uber to book you a cab, for instance. Another thing it, it does is where you say, hey Alexa, what's my horoscope for today? Right? It says, hey, I don't have the horoscope, but I can open this skill that will tell you your horoscope. And if you say yes, it opens the skill and you get the horoscope immediately. So it's sort of moving to that location that also solves for a lot of discovery problem of skills. Uh, you know, because it's voice first, you really, there's no visual element for you to look at Alexa and say, okay, these are the skills I can use, right? I mean, there is like a companion app and a website, but having something like this really solves for discoverability. Hi, I had a question. I'll just, yeah, take that. Yeah, so I think uh, everything, uh, I mean, it's working great, but we can also see that it's in its initial stages. Mm -hmm. Uh, the things that you've spoken about are just kind of convenience things. I mean, we, I can check the weather on my app, but it's maybe saving me a couple of seconds if I just ask. 
So is there also uh, some research that Amazon per se is doing to actually solve a problem? Because none of these are problems that humans are facing. And maybe it's a long journey before that gets resolved. But I wanted to know, is there anything in the pipeline that can actually solve a problem that we are facing rather than just telling us what the weather is or you know, switch on the lights, which I can anyhow do by going and switching it on? Yeah. So before I answer your question, I'd actually counter what you're saying. But if you look at every tech innovation, you can argue the same thing, right? Like, okay, there wasn't really a problem. My horse-drawn carriage could take me to wherever. But then you came up to the car or whatever. Like, did you really need a mobile phone? I could make calls using. So I could really argue that. And I think that's, uh, if you really look at like apps in the early days, they were extremely primitive, right? And they might not have provided the sort of value that they provide now. You had like very basic apps that didn't do too much. So like I said, we're still in the early phase. I really think things like, um, you know, like smart home devices are, just the interaction is, is a lot better using like something that's voice enabled. Uh, if you see like even things like playing music where I, could get, I can get a song instantly, I think it's a better in interaction as opposed to opening your phone, looking for that song, typing it out, and then playing it. Uh, so, I mean, that, that's, what I, that's what I'm going, I'm getting at, that I think it's genuinely, yeah. yeah. If you think about infants, they can't read or write yet, but they can they can understand sound and they can speak. They can mumble some words. So you can think of this as a very fascinating way of getting uh, infants to expose to internet. Like they can access things without learning to read or write. So there's a lot of fascinating stuff that can happen. So similarly, for for people for blind people, for example, for whom screen is a little bit more difficult. I think you're now enabling a voice or a conversational interface. Right. So you can solve a whole bunch of problems that we've not been able to yeah, solve. You're right on the, uh, you know, the, the special ability people that I oh, but I, I, I think I you're generally that, lowering yeah. the barrier to access tech in general with something yeah, that's conversational, exactly. right? Because if, I, if you take my grandmom, I have to really, really teach her like a new UI in an app and she finds it difficult still. But something that's conversational, you don't really need to educate them. Right? You say you can just talk to this and it would get something done. Uh, of course, there are questions like, oh, will it, you know, understand, like, say, Canada, for example. We are not at that stage yet, but we will be, you know, eventually. Okay, that one last question that I think we are. Yeah, okay. 